A quick introduction. I am uh, Swavik. I uh, run a small web design studio in Delhi. It's called Miranj. It's a two-person company. We take client projects. And I'll skip on to the next things. I have a few things first. I want to just clarify the objectives of this session right at the beginning. One is we want, I want us to revisit the design of web. How was web conceived? How was it meant to work? And go in a little bit into that. From there, we want to move on to progressive enhancement. Why is it important? Why is it good? From there, we want to write code in a manner, in a progressive enhancement manner. Right? And finally, we want to do peer review and learn from each other's experience. Right? So that is the overall objective. And uh, if your expectations are different, as I set, set out some of the more expectations here, if your expectations are a little different, please speak up. Maybe I'll be able to change the course. Uh, we have some time. We might be able to change the course, include a few things that you want to note or discuss a few things that you want to know. Okay. Learning syntax or making, making pretty interfaces is not the objective of the session. Okay, I want to clarify this. When we move on to CSS and things like that, it's okay, you can take time to make things good looking, but over here we want to quickly move on. Right? And the objective is also not to tell you how HTML is written or how JavaScript is written. So I'm expecting that you have a little bit of a syntax knowledge right at the beginning. If you don't, like the show of hands so that everyone almost had it. And just in case you didn't show up your hand, uh, please slowly move to a seat next to the person who showed up his hand, okay? So that you can just start pair programming with him and learn about the syntax. Next agenda. So first 25 minutes I put in for zoning in before we coded. Start coding, right? A few things that we want to do, few activities we want to do. We want to start understanding the project in the 15 minutes after that. We'll start developing the project. We'll take a break after we have done with our HTML. Alright? And then we move on to CSS JavaScript. And at the very end, we zone out a bit and talk about a larger picture, a few closing points and things like that. And I have, I want this, the conduct to be very, very, I mean, embraced by everyone, really. I want you to be asking questions. I might not know the answer. There are other intelligent people in the crowd. If you know answers, please contribute. All right. Code or at, at the very least, assist people who are coding. Feedback. Keep things constructive and mutual respect is very important. Uh, which basically means when you're giving feedback, when you're taking feedback, please be respectful. Right? I want to start up with this question and this question only I added yesterday because when I took the name of one dangerous browser, I got an answer, who cares? No one cares about it. So I want to ask this question, why do we not care about some web browsers? <coughs> Quick answers. We want to not be late. Because there's a lot of pain by coding. There are also beyond their support timelines. Because it's outdated. It's beyond the support timeline, so you, you don't want to code. Very few users. Very few people are using that, right? Okay. We don't get a proper output. We don't get a proper output. All right, so the thing is uh, buggy, probably. The ROI is not worth it. The ROI is not worth it. <laughs> Sir, are you a manager? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I, I, I uh, maybe, maybe the ROI is not worth it. Okay, just hold on to this thought. We'll come back to the question right at the very end. Okay. So I want to move on to another question. What's the web? Uh, maybe it'll take it too much time for us to define it. I'll just jump ahead. Uh, so. Tim Berners-Lee, he was a scientist. He started this, a little bit of history. Uh, 1989, that's pretty old, right? In the world of technology, it, things change so fast. And it was built upon some amazing design principles. How many of you have actually gone inside the W3C uh, documentation of the design principles of uh, the web? Has anyone gone into it, looked into it ever? One, one hand. I just want to highlight a few of the design principles here because I think they are really important. And Tim berners he wrote a document in 1998. It's available at this URL. You can get the presentation later. Also, probably look it up. And he said that people keep talking about these principles. I think this will be a starting point. Let me jot down a few of the things which are my personal views right now at, the, at that point of time. And he said the first principle I think that the web uh, that he kept in mind while creating the web was simplicity. Okay, 
that the things have to be very simple, as simple as possible. Uh, the next was modular design. Most of your coders, you don't need to be explained what modular design is. Basically, you take your entire piece of code or you take your project and you divide it into loosely coupled modules, which within themselves are very tightly coupled, right? So that you can take a module out, put another module in, and they should, there should not be very less overlap between them, right? The other thing that he said that being a part of modular design is also a very important principle. The fact that you are a part of a larger thing in which your own code or your own contribution has to be a part of that modular system. That is very important. So if there is a modular system and you walk in and you push in something which is not modular, then that's a problem. Okay. Uh, another point was tolerance and uh, this is also known as the robustness principle. Uh, if you have come across this, it says be liberal in what you require but conservative in what you do. Uh, does uh, everyone follow this? What it tries to say is if you are taking any input or if you are asking for any information, be very liberal about it. So be tolerant about it. right? So if I want to give uh, X amount of uh, information in a different format, for example, there are so many hundreds of date format today. There are hundreds of languages today. There are hundreds of different ways you can give input today. If I want to give my name, I can give in 10 different languages. Probably, uh, if I want to give my credit card details as an example, I might put a space, I might not put a space. If I want to write an HTML code, even in that, I have a huge flexibility. Have you rarely will you see that when you write some syntax, your browser will throw an error. It will accept your HTML code and try to render the best page possible. Right? That is a very important and I wanted to spend some time in tolerance. That is important. Decentralization is, don't have a single blocking point basically. Right? And a uh, test of independent invention, I don't think we have, okay, some part of it got cropped away, but that's because right outside there was an Adobe update which just took away all my fonts. Anyways. But uh, test of independent invention basically simply says if somebody else already has invested in your system, would theirs work, uh, their system work with the your, your system? So is your system independent enough that someone else's system will also work with? Clearly you can go and read up. This is not something that uh, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on in the things we do though. Uh, but some part of it is important actually. And the other important thing was, and this is extremely important, says principle of least power. And what it says is that if you write a document or I, I'm giving a very... Uh, uh, rigid example here. If you create a document in a technology which is very low powerful, very low powered, it can be consumed in a much more wide, wider fashion. So for example, then the example he writes in that same uh, piece of text is, if there is a Java applet which does some kind of functionality, the only piece of software that can decode it and make sense out of it is Java and the applets uh, engine that is in it. If you write a document which is so low powered and so simple as HTML, there are thousands of different engines that will be able to make sense of that document and consume it. And that is one of the reasons he goes on to say that I did not intend HTML to be a procedural language. I wanted HTML to be a markup language so that there can be thousands of systems that can read the code and interpret it and make use of that. All right. Does this does this make sense? Because this is very important going forward. Anyone who opposes this, I don't like this. I want to write in a very complicated language, but I want doesn't matter if it's a proprietary language. I don't to reach out to a wider audience is not my goal. Is there anyone with this mindset? Uh, because that is against the principle of web. There is nothing wrong to be in that mindset, but that's against the principle of web. All I'm trying to point out, right? Further from there, W3C went on with a whole range of principles and the readability, timeliness, what is there, go and read about this, I'm not going to spend time on these. Uh, but uh, further and uh, they went on to a mission where they said that we want web for all, web for everything, web for a rich interaction, data and services and trust. And that is important, web for all, all and web for on everything. And because of these principles, as a result today, it has been around for more than two decades and it's been there in so many devices. Like 
every handle device that you think they are connected to the internet refrigerators get connected to the uh, to the web uh, your uh, there are browsers there are cars every place that you can think of they can get connected to the web because of these open principles they said i we want it everywhere we want it very simple so that anyone can take it and consume it and today that is why web has been turning ubiquitous right <coughs> everywhere this is a good thing for us but challenge for us is there is a fragmentation of client there are too many things that are consuming our html pages today right and it's not just the browsers anymore there are plenty of things that are consuming our website today uh and for a long time what we have done is how have we coped up with uh, these browser fragmentation there was uh, i netscape initially very early days slowly moved on firefox came in safari came in chrome came in other browsers are coming in how did how did we cope up with all these things uh generally i would say it was graceful degradation that is the way in which we did it and the graceful de uh, degradation what it means is uh, you take the most latest web browser okay for example let me talk about today i take say chrome and i'm not advocating chrome but let's say chrome i'll make my website on that put in all the amazing things use css3 use html5 use javascript make it slick one page single page application right we make all that and then i think okay let me just go ahead and test on firefox yeah most things work there's this one point that doesn't work oh let me just patch it let me just go and go to internet explorer <laughs> then things don't work patch it patch it patch it let me should i go for a older internet explorer yes let me go to i9 few more things don't work or few more things do work we are in a different way oh my god patch it patch it roi goes down right <laughs> i eat very low roi you don't want to do it anymore right how who wants to patch a old browser and with so much so many different kinds of browsers available today uh we can't cope with that method anymore is what i'm trying to propose and this is not a new proposal actually uh in fact uh, there are few more points that i have you have only if you have been only testing in browsers there are text mode text mode browsers i don't know if you have actually gone ahead and used any of them uh there are screen readers for people who cannot see there are read it later services that have come up today insta paper pocket okay they go to your website and just just save the copy of your web page so that you can read it later flipboard has started consuming it google has always been doing it and you have always been later bothered about the fact oh no seo ne work right seo is not there i am not getting go indexed on google right and if only the things that are consuming if that is not a variable there are more variables like even if you say that i am going for devices hundreds of devices different capabilities all of them right even if it's the same browser maybe you are running a uh, chrome on five different mobile devices maybe one has a older version of chrome maybe one has a newer maybe the device capability is different it had pop function differently the screen screen dimensions are changing the method of interaction is changing you had a numeric type pads initially you have keyful keyboards qwerty keyboards now you have touch interaction so even the browser remains the same it's actually working across a variety of devices which are different ways of interacting and this thing is only going to get worse right does anyone think that it's not going to get worse no one thinks and uh, 2003 and uh, it's a little uh, ironic that uh, 11 years later uh, after this presentation of inclusive web design for the future by steve and nick uh, 11 years later also in the world we have to promote the fact that progressive enhancement is important okay and what is progressive enhancement i'll just come to that and this is the uh, presentation at which they 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 actually gave a term to a different uh, a different kind of way in which we start coding our websites they proposed it gave a name pro progressive enhancement and the method is this that what is the most important thing in your website most important thing in your website content, content huh? Did anyone read it up? 
content right so you take content then you add markup around your content that means you structure your code you structure your content right once you do that then you add styles right and once you do that then you add javascript right and this is the method in which you follow and you do your uh, coding practices you never thought of browser you don't have to think of browser you have to think of content you have to think of html standards but not a browser because you don't know what kind of browser will be consuming it right if at any point of time you start visualizing oh my heading is going to be this this big bold thing in the center you are assuming that your heading or your page is actually going to be put up on a display it might actually not be right today in the villages of india people are accessing web on smss right that's a big thing in uh, the villages of india there are services that have come up so assumption that people will always be able to see your content even forget from accessibility purposes right the fact that outreach purpose uh we haven't covered majority of the world yet the web hasn't covered majority of the world yet and people are still accessing through very 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 low power devices just about being able to communicate on the web right so quickly what is the web again i don't want to define over there but very specific points we have a protocol right http is there uh http serves urls and urls are what help you locate resources on the web right address them the other thing is files they are mostly html css javascript and there are media files on the web right so these three things put together generally make up the web <coughs> so here i want to introduce a workshop project okay uh i wanted to keep a very small project very 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 uh, small so that we get more time on this uh so i thought that uh, i do the back end i am your back end guy you are the front end guy guys right so you are all interface your code with my back end and the functionality that i am trying to provide is i am trying to let people just store their expenses okay as simple as that making an expense app so what is the functionality in the app right now it's a person can sign in can enter a new expense the expense gets recorded he can edit or delete that expense and he can sign out nothing else all right that's as simple as it anyone is okay with the use case and i i take my liberty and call it has expenses i might have actually done a few ip violations by calling it has to actually right now <laughs> uh now what are the knowns in the system can anyone tell me what are the things that you can be very sure of that the system will have at, at least between you as the person who is uh, creating the website and publishing the website and people who will be consuming the website between that what are the knowns in the system can anyone just point out a few browser browser okay user user is the known so let let's talk about uh, okay fine let pick that also user is a known of course there will be a user there will be a user there will be a browser transaction do you know that transaction will actually happen you don't know it after you after it starts being used it may happen S -s -s any other quick points here uh that is we are going to design an api right now in a way uh but before you take a decision on that you have to figure out what are the knowns in the system right otherwise how will you for whom will you make an api what will you make it for, for what purpose you will make an api think like that let me give a simple thing according to me the only knowns in the system are that there is a server there is a client they talk over http right and there will be a browser there and the browser might be of any kind okay uh, and let me simply call it client because when as soon as you hear browser you think chrome or firefox so that's why i'm saying client server and they communicate over http and the fact the very basic minimum basis is that the client will accept an html file and will be able to figure out what to do with that am i okay with my assumptions here okay we can't assume anything beyond that we can't assume the fact that there will be a mouse pointer or a screen or a keyboard or the fact that uh, what viewing distance that the user will be sitting from things like that they are all unknowns in the system when you start a web project 
Agreed. Uh, what about uh, how do I do this? Uh, can we can we do the a fist of five? A fist of five means basically you raise up your hand and put on the rating of one and to five how much you agree. So five for if you agree with me, one if you don't. So can you just do a fist of five? So for the fact that these are the knowns in the system, agreed? Okay. So most of you agree. Most of you almost hundred percent five means hundred percent agree. That yes, only these are the knowns in the system. There is nothing else. Those who did not, did you want? Do you want to give any other point that you think want to add to the knowns in the system? No. All right. No point. First activity. I we want to identify purpose and prioritize our goals over here before we start on the web project. And what can our uh, goals be? I have uh, told you the purpose before. We want to run an expense app. Uh, but uh, in our goals, I feel that these are the goals that we need to prioritize. Whether the fact that. Our content is going to be consumable. Is our system going to be functional? Is the final thing going to be aesthetic? That means good looking. Is it going to be fast? Is it going to be accessible? Is it going to be reachable or locatable? If you have to prioritize this, or if you want to add anything else, right? You can add any more goals in this. If you have to prioritize, what is the most important of this? Speak up. Out of all these, most important. This accessible. The fact that the content is consumable. Functional. 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 Reachable. So, but reachable is for, oh, first. First, what, priority number one. Consumable. Reachable. Functional. Okay. Let me say this. If I can't reach your content, how will I consume it? Do I have a point? If I can't locate your content, I can't consume it. I will not reach your content. Agreed? So what do you mean by reachable? Should I translate it to technology? Yes, URL. A URL. Yes, so that's implicit, right? I am your... trying to make everything explicit here. But so is... make make it explicit. If you think that is implicit, take it out. That's a known. Because we have going to have a client and a server. Uh, that is, a, well, that's definitely unknown because you are talking over HTTP, HTTP will su support URLs. But, but what are your goals while you are creating the design of the system? What should be the priority number one in serving? Like, will you have, question, would you first spend your time or uh, would you spend your time uh, uh, over creating good content and just totally not think about whether it's accessible over URLs or not? Or whether you prefer to give a URL access to it than uh, consume a bit. Let me give you a solid example. If you have a single page application which does not upload, update the URLs in the browser, fail according to me. You are giving the content, you are not updating the URL, fail according to me. Because you can go back to your state. You cannot return to your state, you cannot locate your state, you cannot link to your state. These are the basis and I told you what the web was made of. You, HTTP is there, URLs is there and files are there. You are giving a file but you are not giving URL, you are breaking the web. That's why I think this is first. Most important thing that it should definitely have is a reachable thing, that is according to me. Uh, let's see, what is point number two? Functional. functional over content? Yeah. Content more important, functionality more important. Functional. I think content. Why? If I don't give you content, how will you perform functions? Or maybe you misinterpreted what I wanted to say. Maybe. Reverse. I mean, uh -huh. if it's consumable but not functional, that is again. Okay, let me give you an example. If in the expenses app, I can see what my expenses are. But I cannot edit an expense. What is more important? Should people be able to only feed data to the system and edit expenses or at least see the expenses? That is more important. So isn't you rendering it uh -huh. part of its function? Rendering is a part of its function. So, so if you uh, consume it, isn't it part of the function? So let me point out, when I say consumable, I mean well-structured HTML. And only if you have a well-structured HTML will you be able to render it. And only if you are able to render it, after that people will be able to, to perform functions on it. Right? Does it make sense? So by the same vein of thought, right. it's reachable, 
but it doesn't have content it's useless that means Absolutely. consumable is more important than reachable right consumable okay let me take a step back if you read something and there's nothing there what's the point i think we're so looking at what can first. what can happen like i'm saying what is, is one pr- i'm just prioritizing i'm not saying exactly. one happens my the second does it is that i need to build this app right okay my priority is not that 10000 people use the app i need to build it first agree so is it content the most primary thing for you as a developer or as a product person <laughs> did you did you know the fact that the you are, did you did you realize or did you rethink that when you are developing at the point of developing you are continuously making use of urls to access your Yeah, even you development files i think maybe the definition the bit skewed to maybe it. maybe maybe so the reachable or readable as he said is being able to reach a certain state not just being able to reach your website so as the example so i agree like i, I think this is more of seeing that let, at let every point you are keeping develop. all the goals in mind at every stage of it does not mean you book a url for before designing a website it basically says that your goals should be at every point you should focus or rather rather when you, when you put out the product let me say this when you are in the final stage of the product you must in this order ensure that your product is reachable it has content it is functional what what about the rest i think if you are developing a new content or a new functionality you should make sure it is also reachable so reachable i think is always first in my opinion so you can deliberate over this or we we are taking too much time on this i just speed it up a bit okay just for the interest of us getting into code uh any anyone who wants to comment on these three other unknowns i think uh my view point is we should be anything on the thing is should be addressable and reachable if you can't reach it you can't use it or you can't even consume it then you make sure that once it is reachable once the user is able to reach your thing you are able to provide him the right content once you get the right content he is able to perform the functions at the very least do the work that he has come to do on your on the website it could be just to consume the content then the thing ends there but if it could be to do other steps like in our case we would want the person to add a new expense or edit a old expense or change things then he should be able to do it these three any uh, ideas on these three oh, accessible accessible. accessible over fast fast over accessible oh, accessible over fast i think web for all that for everyone means we need to make sure that everyone is able to access doesn't matter you are differently able that is one form of accessibility many other form you might not be differently able your devices might be low powered old browsers anything else it should be able to access that i think fast is a part of accessible because if you have a slow internet connection for it to be accessible it needs to be fast maybe maybe it, like it could be it could be a subset it may not be i'm uh, i'm making it i'm taking it to be let let's make all these modular okay <laughs> let's not overlap these in a way so once it is accessible i think it will be fast and aesthetic fast. Fast. fast and then it should be pretty so if a, a person has amazing internet connection and latest browsers he gets all of it in a way Uh, and also if someone doesn't get all of it doesn't mean that he is the thing is not aesthetic there is always some aesthetic okay is there is nothing known as absolute zero in aesthetics or absolute zero in speed unless and until it is actually zero <laughs> right so it's always has some aesthetic how much time you want to spend how be- good you want to make it from the aesthetic point of view best browser best device gets the all of them but you are ma- but if you build it from the, these at this level right if you prioritize this while building right at the beginning maybe at the moment you do reachable and consumable you have a product that is at least reachable and consumable then you add functionality you have more things and so on and so forth okay so i talk a little bit about protocol because i think this is all, always uh, i'll speed it up a bit we have four methods get put post and delete uh unfortunately I I won't say unfortunately but I would say it just so happens that today we are only fighting between get and post because the other two put and delete are not being uh, implemented by most uh, browsers and things like that but it's very important to know the difference between get and post can anyone quickly tell me the difference one Identity. of you sorry get simply i want to get the content in very simple words for everyone post means i want to make a change in the system it could be created it could be edited it could be delete it is making a change in the system which is not done by get so get will never make a change in the system post will make changes in the system right 
keep this in mind always at any point and I'll give you a very prime example over here. Log out should be a post request. You should not have a link, a link, a tag, which says log out, click and you have logged out. Why? Because it's changing the state of the system. Does it make sense? Right? This is one of the biggest mistakes that lots of people make throughout a tags for the wrong reasons. Forms for only, post is only associated with forms for people. Generally for start, for, as a starting developer, I was a forms hai to post karna hai. Is, is the thing, forms post, right? But that's not the idea. The more basic idea is making a change in the system. Then next thing is URLs are for people. We want to design the best URLs as possible. And there's a document that again says cool URLs don't change. If you make something locatable and addressable, addressable, never change it. Keep it there for eternity as long as you can serve that page for as long as you can, right? So uh, I want to come to this small activity. We want to give URL to everything. Can we quickly, quickly, in, uh, I'll give you uh, five minutes max. Okay. You know what are the things that we are doing in the system. We are going to have a login. Uh, a person is going to sign in. Person is going to be able to see his expenses. Person can make edits to his expenses, add an expense, delete an expense and sign out of the system. Can you quickly work me out what can the URLs be? Five minutes please. Uh, two of you together would be nice. Just quickly, just self-organize. Because I think this is uh, something that. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so when I'm saying URLs, I don't want. Uh, just tell me post. Give me a URI in a in a way. Don't so don't just forget the domain uh, part. Okay, everything beyond the domain, what it should look like. What would be the most human readable for people, addressable and easily understandable URLs? Domain name is everyone. Yeah, so domain, just avoid the domain name there because you will always have the domain. So I want you to describe the things inside because in domain you cannot control the URI part. Do you have something in there? Slash log and slash my expenses, slash add delete expense. Okay. So I have a quick, uh, uh, thankfully someone has done something first and I'm going to just jump ahead because we want to get into code quickly. Someone says that we have slash login for signing in. Alright. Uh, slash my expenses to view our expenses. Alright. Uh, slash add expense to add an expense. Uh, slash edit expense slash 10, 10 being probably the primary key of the our uh, object over there to edit. One part of the URL, uh, when you're designing URL, one thing that you you should take a uh, consider is at any point the URL should be hackable. So if you just chop off the last part, it should still make sense. Right? So if you just chop off, chop off slash modify expense or edit expense slash 10, I chop off 10 slash edit expense. It does not become a complete thing. You change the order. So you just switch the order. Because slash 10 means show me the object. Slash 10 slash edit would probably mean I want to edit this object. Make sense? And I can chop off the last edit part and still have a valid URL. Similarly, chop off the add part and have a valid URL. Sorry? I don't actually need a slash delete or a slash edit. No, I, you don't need a slash delete, uh, but you don't. You do need it if you want to send a confirmation. Yes. If you, if you, if a person says I want to delete, mm -hmm. there are two ways of looking at it. You immediately delete, or you confirm that you you want to delete. Okay. In case he wants to confirm, for that he can be make a get. And the thing that when you're saying there can be a post and uh, there can be a get. People will always be making a GET request to one of your URLs. So if you say that delete will always be post, right? People can make a GET request to that URL. What happens then? Then you show the you show the icon. You you show a confirmation that no. you want to delete. No. You want what to I'm saying is use the HTTP mm -hmm. method delete or put or post to differentiate between your edit. As as I said, uh, we have GET and post. Unfortunately, most browsers are not implementing put and delete. I would love to use put and delete actually. I'm with you on that. Unfortunately, the implementation is not there in the world. Can you uh, name some browsers that don't support Uh So actually, I think it's less to do with the browsers and more to do with the server. routers along. along routers the along, the servers along, capacity. Yes. So the except even today at this point of time, we have actually boiled down to get and post in the world. Uh, 
I'll have to look that up exactly which are the browsers which and I'll because I mean, slowly it is adding. I in turn with cross domain uh, request put in the report over. I I ten I ten cross domain request. Okay, so anyone else has an idea about browsers that don't? Older browsers definitely some of them don't. The thing is because all, over that, all apps or frameworks that rely on restfulness they won't work. Yeah. So, so, so the rest 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 yes. I, I get your point. Now I'll, I'll, I'll also I'll also tell you one more point in the browsers not being able to think. If a person has to use your system and he has to make a request to your system, he the only request that he can make first initially is get because the URL bar supports that, right? Beyond that, beyond that get request, it's your application which might enable it, which might not enable it. It's a little unfortunate and I do agree with you that put and delete should be supported but a harsh reality over here is it's generally not and that's why we are clubbing them together. Just for this but I totally agree with you that put and delete are important and can be useful. Unfortunately it's not supported. That's so, at my exact end. Yes, do you have so any points? Most of the frameworks like Rails that use put and delete are actually using a workaround wherein you have a form that which submits a post request and has a hidden field which, has a hidden field which specifies put uh, and delete. Put or delete. You can always support the cross domain request. So, so first yeah. of all, cross domain requests don't support most things. That's not a browser limitation, that's a framework limitation. When you have cross support, it's a security limitation. No, we are not doing anything cross domain here. We are not doing anything. No, no, we ask question which browser doesn't support. You said cross domain requests in IE don't support put and delete. That's a security limitation, not a browser limitation. No, it's not a security limitation. It's not a security limitation. It's not a security limitation. Cross domain requests. The fact that cross domain requests have very limited things that it can take is a security uh, issue that has been implemented there. That is why the the yes. things are very so I'm limited. saying it's not a browser limitation. IE 10 supports put and delete. If you do a same, either, way, delete, it put either, and delete. either way you cannot do it. <laughs> so this is it. either way relevant because even if you want to use put and delete, your URL should still support your put and delete URL should still support a get request. Yes. That is the point he's trying to make. Whether you want to use put and delete, most of put and delete is should still with a, with a get should open a get page anyway. Yes, for a confirmation for a put or for a delete. That is the point. Whether you using post or Okay, I am going to cut it off here and we are, we are going to talk more about this so that we can quickly uh, get to the activity. I'm, oh, it's taking a lot of time. But the switching that makes sense. In a, in a way that, that is what I want okay. to say. One in, suggestion for you is but instead yes. of having modify expense, show expense, mm -hmm. just have expenses which shows the list, have an ID which shows the item mm -hmm. and have slash edit which show, allows you to edit or slash delete or allows you to delete. Yeah, that's what my clear. my system does exactly that. <laughs> so, have so, so I have a slash. Just to be clear, yeah. so a lot of us who use frameworks that I know have implemented certain delete and put methods. Okay. Those are not technically put and delete. They're, those are workarounds. Those are yeah, workarounds. So they are post. post. They are always post. They are generally post with, with a workaround, and inside the framework, it says that there's a hidden field that says do a put. And then you translate that into okay. I have to do a put. You can just open the browser source to see the the form. The headers. headers you can uh, see the headers. What that are going on? Not not even the headers. You can just look at the HTML source itself, and you will see that you will have an, a form element so inside the hidden element. Translates to. So then the routing uh, on the server will take a look at that and modify it. Is it done within the server? Like this browser doesn't support, so let me integrate. No, it always it always uh, goes over for always over post. Doesn't As a standard like today, we are always doing things over post yeah. in reality on the wire. You can open it in on the wire. It's always happening over post and delete. A uh, post and uh, get. Okay, so it's not even a hack per se. It's a basically of doing things. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I can't answer that. It basically is a hidden field whether it's, it's a hack or not is up to you to decide. But okay. it works. I, I have a slide at the very end which uh, will probably satisfy this point which is something that I... Uh, anyways, now we are going to quickly move on to the files. Markup. So what does HTML do? It gives structure and meaning to the content. I, I don't want to highlight much on that except for this fact that why do we want to give structure and meaning to the content? Content is the fact that if I have a structure and a meaning then the, then the content is functional many systems will be able to understand it and interpret it and do it differently. The fact that you have a Safari uh, reader that can take a page and can generate the only the article and just remove everything else is primarily because your content is structured otherwise it will not happen. The fact that flipboards work, fact, fact, uh, fact that lots of different systems are able to extract data from your uh, pages is because of HTML and that is something that we have to really take care of. While doing HTML think just the meaning not the looks. Don't go by the fact that I need a big uh, 
a big statement like we have launched, right? That's why I put it in H1 tag. Is that the most important thing in the page? Is that the most meaningful heading to the page? If yes, then put the H1 tag. Don't figure out because today style is separated from your markup. Fine. There's a excellent post uh, on the NPR blog uh, uh, that uh, says create once, publish everywhere. This is something that has started very recently, where you're trying to make sure that your content once created is if you're able to publish it everywhere possible, right? So today I make some content. If I write a blog, it should be on Insta paper. It should be consumed by plenty of different things today. And you don't even know tomorrow what use case it might serve. Right? So, because five years back we did not know that something like Insta paper, or ten years back we did not know something like these summary readers and all these things can come in because of this. And in the future we don't know what can happen. Amazing design principles of HTML. HTML is forward compatible. I'm just focusing on one. HTML is forward compatible, which is so brilliant. The fact that even if you have an older browser, right, the browsers that we hate, they will be able to be they'll be happy to work in newer tags. They have a very healthy default. They say if I don't know the tag, it will be div. Okay, I'll I'll just process it as div and do it. And that's the beauty of the system. That means you can extend the tags of HTML. And today we have HTML5. Tomorrow I don't know what more many more tags we are going to have. And older browsers will technically be still be able to support it. The reason they some they don't is because they're buggy. And bugs are a different thing. Being aged is a different thing. Okay. Uh, so, on the flip side, uh, the, the consequence of this is any code we write will be actually render fine on the browser. That doesn't mean that it's good, okay? So, you have to be careful about that. Just because it renders fine, doesn't good. Tags like I and B, italics and bold, that was there earlier, they have subtle semantic meaning today. Go up and look at the semantic meanings. Don't use them for the visual styling of italics and bold. Even though that might be the case how it is served by some browsers because tomorrow browsers might not make it italic. Okay. Right, HTTP method, we discussed a little bit about this. Unfortunately, uh, it's a problem with my system. I'll only take get and post. Please bear with me. Uh, and before we move on to the style, we want to jump into uh, our HTML coding. So, uh, here's what I want you to do. Uh, uh, okay. I have a single computer here. Can anyone go to the IP address 192.168.1.5? All of you don't go there, please. I just hope that my computer will be able to handle it. 1.5. Does it work? Yes. Yeah. Something open. I okay, not that half. This for half. Just register. There is something was initialized there or something. Go there and give yourself a name. Just a name. Okay, uh, that could be any username that you want to use, and, and all your URLs that you will have will be served under that. Okay, so if you have, if you, if my name is Sovik, if I give Sovik, so slash Sovik and onwards will be all the things that are. So make it URL friendly also. Don't put spaces. Under that. Sorry. So you you just give a name for your own dev environment. And the name that you give will be also used for you to serve on the network, right? It will initialize a repository also for you. And immediately later, it will give you a few instructions how can you clone that repository onto your computer. Uh, if you use Mercurial, so how many of you use Mercurial are very happy with it? Very few? Okay. If you if you don't know Mercurial, you can use Geo, a GUI, a, a few downloads there, right there, it'll just come out of the computer, quickly install it, you'll be able to clone the repository. If you are a Git fan, there's a hacky, uh, not a hacky, but a tricky thing underneath on that page. You can install those things and you can use Git commands on a Mercurial repository. That can also be done. So, the command line where Mercurial is Git aren't all that different. The command set is the same. Largely the same, fun some functionality, are, some of them are a little different. So I, so the objective is not to waste time on this. That is why I'm asking you quickly download the easy Mercurial or something like that. That is there. Install it in your system. It will and let it clone the repository for you. The repository at the beginning is empty, and if you click on one of them, uh, the link that is there, it should point you to uh, open up a page for you, in which you'll see just a JSON dump. Does it do that? 
It does. So someone confirmed it does, so I'm going to take his word for it. Just to save some embarrassment. Okay, we have about 20 minutes to do the HTML just because we have lost a lot of time. Uh, try to make, uh, once you uh, download the uh, repository, I suggest start with just plain HTML pages. In case you know how to do mustache, and if you have a mustache compiler on your computer, if you can do that, that means probably run mustache PHP or something like that. Use that and compile it. Otherwise, run a, make a simple HTML page starting from HTML till closing of HTML tags and in the body, what do you want the first slash root URL to be do? Okay. The home page of the app to do. In my view, the functionality should be the to be able to sign up and sign in. Okay. Inside that introductory welcome page, if you just scroll down a bit, I have put in some resources which you can read and refer to. And I, re I in case you're not aware of those resources, they're really handy. The HTML docs are there, right? Uh, the developers dot what wg dot org is a, a very well designed site for developers. It removes all the HTML docs that developers don't need and browser manufacturers need. So for you, what is the semantic meaning of HTML tags with use cases, with examples, where it works, how it works, they are all there. Feel free to refer to them. And just in case you have completed the page of uh, slash sign in, slash sign up, slash sign out, uh, just let me know. Uh, by the way, uh, let me also add, when you go to the <coughs> actual URL, 192.168.1.5, slash you put the name that you have given, it will be showing a JSON down. And that is the way in which you can figure out what are the variables that you get when you go to that URL and therefore in your mustache you can put in those, uh, use those names. Right? Does why, it make why, sense? Why don't you just look at the URL on here? My computer's resolution has given, I don't know what he has done. Doesn't matter. Let me see. I can't see how the things open. Oh, it's open. Super. So let me initialize mine. So we'll just do the same thing. That makes sense. So I am just giving this. Everyone don't do it. Simon, oops. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. I have a new repository. Thank, thank you for not using my preferred name. So if I go to slash Swami PG here, I see a. JSON down. These are the variables that are available to me. If you see the URLs there, they are the handy pointers for you what are all the URLs in the system. Right? You know from there what URLs you have to use. In fact, you don't have to hard code URLs, you can start using these. Uh, you can in mustache, if you use mustache, if anyone, uh, anyone who has no idea about mustache, please raise your hand. Plenty of people. People who have idea about mustache over here, any anyone, you have. And you. So, Arpan, do you know, uh, are you comfortable with mustache? Yeah. Can you quickly uh, uh, help the last row out what it is? By the way, if you're not uncomfortable, I have some handy resources for you as well. Uh, just go, just scroll down into the main page. There's a mustache manual here. Are you able to see it, mustache manual? By the way, right now I'm not advocating that you start using mustache immediately. First, use just an HTML. But just in case you want to know how to use those variables in your code, just download this mustache manual. It tells you it's basically a templating language, which which is a logicless template. All it does is it takes a a variable context variable which you see on the screen there, and it will give you an access point uh, points to in embed those values inside your HTML template. So you have. HTML, say you have a paragraph tag and you want to put in some content from the, the that key value pairs that you see in the JSON. So you have to just use two curly braces and you see URLs dot say sign out. So right, URLs dot sign out, that value will just come here. Alright, it's just that. Uh, anyone has a little bit of confidence once you see the manual? Uh, just for the benefit of those who have still not managed to uh, get the uh, initial thing started, when you go to the first page, just look at the size, when you go to the first page, there's an initialize your dev environment. 
right? That has checked out for me because I have already initialized once. But if you click on this, you get to this page where you can put any name and submit it. Once you submit it, you get a set of instructions. The instructions are how do you clone your repository and how how do you access your own website on to the server. If you have followed those, then we know that we have to create three HTML pages right now for a start. What they will enable you to do is create a home page, create a sign in page, create a sign up page, because these are the only three pages that people can access without you logging into the system. Once you create those three pages, and I'm going ahead with the instructions. So once you create those three pages, uh, you can get the jumpstart code right at the beginning. There, there's a get a jumpstart code. What the jumpstart code contains is a list of mustache template file names and you need to use those names so that my code is able to recognize which template file has to go for which page. So, so, so I will just show that thing to you. Okay. Right? Makes sense. So if you come here, So many jumpstarts. Okay, so I have this jumpstart uh, folder here on my desktop, and I have opened them up. So you see a list of files. So if you go through the list of files, you'll see lots of files which start with page underscore. So all your sign up pages are going to be served. This, page, this mustache template is going to be served. So your HTML file, your complete HTML should be generated out of, for the sign up page should be generated out of page underscore sign up dot mustache. Right? That means your complete HTML code for your sign up page should be kept inside this. But Mustache allows you to combine, slice your templates and combine it in a different format so that you can have a common header that is from head to body, common footer, anything that is there common across all pages. For that I have created two more files, footer, header and for the main body, these are the body. I will just open this up in a text editor and it's showing you. Okay guys, so say I am going to go to the home page, so I have page underscore home, you see uh, include, this is the mustache uh, template code to include a heading file, uh, to include a partial template basically. So you have a header template, a footer template and a body template. So the header template is underscore header dot mustache, which has the initial html till opening tag of the body, my footer is closing tag of the body and closing tag of the html. So this is across all pages I have up till the opening body tag and the closing body and closing html tag. My actual home page is anything that I write inside body underscore home dot, dot mustache. So whatever content you have inside body right now in your html pages just copy it inside body underscore home dot mustache and you can put these files in your source code repository commit it and push it. For those who need help in how do you push and commit, just ask me, I'll, I'll come and show it to you. Or I, what I'll do is, what I'll parallelly also show it to you over here, how do you do it. Uh, there is something that I've done right now, just to get you an even deeper jump start. And that is, there's a repository called, uh, uh, obviously this is localhost because it's running on my computer, in your case it will be 192.168.1.5, I hope everyone can follow. There's a repository called Solid DG, which is my code. It has all the HTML written, maybe we can get a jump start on the HTML front. I would like you to review the code for just a couple of minutes so that you can ensure that be sure that there is no CSS there, only HTML and the fact that that file can open across lots of browsers. And one of the examples is of course just in case you have uh, uh, an option of opening these files on uh, the links browser. How many of you have used links? Has anyone heard of this? 
So links is a text 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 browser. What I'm sorry, these colors are all gone. Okay, okay, you can still view it probably. This corner you can still see. You can probably try to do a on site a font size increase changes the okay make sense okay so links browser what it does is it will only read your html file okay and it will not read any css it will not read any uh, javascript this is one of the best ways to ensure that you all the content that you have written makes sense. So there is something known as something that looks like title, something that says welcome. You can go sign in, sign up. There's a sign in form. You can fill up this. You can submit it, and the and the entire process will simply work. All right, the your entire thing will work. Uh, just in case you make websites, I it will be great after you write your markup. Or even if you intermingle your markup with your CSS and JavaScript, you make sure that the links browser is able to read it and you're able to, as a human, be able to uh, read through the things. Just in case you're doing things in which there is uh, too much Ajax and the things are actually not on the on the HTML page, it will not show up because it's not going to run JavaScript. And most likely all search engines, all bots, everything uh, will be using this and using this also makes the content really accessible. If you use uh, if you use the semantic markup tags of HTML, that's one of the foundation of accessibility on the web, right? Because when the screen reader reads it, if the user says, "I want to see the navigation," it will jump to the nav tag and it will tell you what the nav tag is. At least you can enable those features for whichever uh, uh, systems that support it. A screen reader is a, what a blind user uses to read things on the screen, hears it, and says. Uh, and use the keyboard or some other control to go next link, next link, next link, things like that. So it will read it out for you. M much like voiceover if you have iPhone, if, if you have this, the screen readers on Mac as well. So you can go next page, next page, and go next page, and go to the next. And uh, some, uh, of course, this this session is not on accessibility, so I'll just skip over this part, but the idea is to make sure that you use structured content. Uh, when the, is the network up? No, not yet. I would have liked you to just take this code and continue from here. Okay? Because, uh, uh, and that is not being possible. Let me just continue in my, with my presentation in the, for the time being. Because that's... So I'll just move on to the styles in, for the time being. Assumption is, so here's the understanding. We are going to write HTML, no styles, no classes. I pointed out to a few people, no styles, no cl classes. There are a few people who I saw who, instead of using the label tags to label a field, they are using the placeholder, placeholder attribute inside the field. So what happens is, it says username inside the field, once you click on that, username goes away and you can type. That's semantically incorrect, placeholder is not a replacement for label, right? Few, few things, so don't do into that. Once your HTML is pristine, is structured, is clear, let's move on. Let's go move into styles. So we are going to styles in CSS. Style can assist functionality, but it's not the most robust mechanism, and it is not robust at all if you want to give functionality, right? Functionality should primarily be done over just the initial layer. Your entire HTTP, your forms, your requests should be able should enable people to create a user start adding expenses and things like that. Once the network is up, you can download my code, start using, start creating users and things like that. And uh, start adding expenses. So yeah. CSS is, has advanced a lot. It can do quite many, some of those things that JavaScript used to do before, right? It never does any functionality. What What does it do? Not functionality, but I mean, it dresses up things with JavaScript. Give an example. Uh, like you can... Uh, uh, open or close the things, move things around. Yes, so I have been able to uh, display text animate the text that I would probably use JavaScript jQuery for, but I can use it and it would animate from one text to the other uh, word by word, like alternate colors. Okay. But again, remember animation is not necessarily behavior. Animation used to be done by JavaScript because there was nowhere to do it with yes. CSS. I'm just saying that it has evolved, it has, it can do more things now. So, I agree, I agree with you, CSS does more things, I'm coming on to that, actually. Uh, so you've jumped ahead a bit. My point over here is, your style should not be the functionality. 
So just just question these things. If you are coloring things up to give meaning to them, then you are actually leaving out people behind. Right? There are people who cannot identify colors. <laughs> Which is why if you have to give meaning to things, use the first first use the right marker. And then when you go on to the styles, just keep a little bit in mind that okay, my style should be very accessible. Right? Uh, if I have to give a link color, maybe I also underline it so that it's more accessible. Uh, I don't know how many of you have done it. Uh, people often use name colon the input field. Username colon input field, password colon the input field. The the thing that is there in colon is a very convent. It's a convention, right? It's primarily convention style to indicate the separation between the label and the thing. These things go into CSS. So CSS has something known as after. And you can put in custom content inside that and you use the colons and put those things over there instead of putting it in the markup because they are not wanted. Make sense? These are little pointers that I am giving you. CSS itself is pretty robust and uh, unknown rules are ignored. If if the rules have any error, if I if, uh, so if you have an old uh, uh, CSS uh, parser and it sees a, say a RGB a color or a rem text, rem font size, it will just ignore them. right? So you can go ahead and use the new functionalities. Use the user. Few things to keep in mind is if you have a group of selectors, then the entire block gets ignored. So that is something you have to keep in mind. Uh, but yeah, was after there in the old CSS? After was there in the old CSS, I think. I think so. CSS two. It was there. Okay, works are different. Also, the fact that one thing that you have to uh, ensure over there are. Uh, Style is something, please understand, style is something that you are making for a certain, after you have taken certain assumptions, what that is going to be on the screen, maybe. Right? So, the absence of style should not make your website either unusable or not functional or no content. These things should not happen. So, your website should still be usable on IE8 even if the colons are not there because after, right? A person sees name and input field works. It's more important to make it work than to make it look the same. Anyways, so order rules carefully so that the newer rules are right at the very end because if you use the old rules at the end, then it will override the newer rules for newer browsers. So your order of the CSS rules should be very uh, 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 in the right order. And there's a big question. Uh, do you know the answer to this? Beep. Answer yes. Yes, the answer is no. Is fist of five? How many agree? The answer is no. No. Very few. Man. So many people are still confused. Why should a website not look the same in every browser? In fact, that is. Huh? Should it possibly look the same in links? If you go to this website, you get the answer as well. It says no, and it opens differently on every depending on what browser you are opening it. Old browsers will still open it, it will still say no, but in a different way. Okay? It doesn't have to look the same because the main purpose is again, as we know, prior priority. Once we are making it locatable, content should be consumable, functional, aesthetics comes later. Much later. So it's okay if the old browsers do not have any priority of course. Media queries are your helpers now. It is very important that uh, we start using these media queries, we don't use them very well. Honestly speaking, even I don't know some of them because I have not used them. It is important for us to start using them because only if we start using them, will these things get better and more things will come in. So today you can probably say that, uh, I, is, my, is it a handheld device? You can target a particular style to a handheld device. You can target a particular sty style for a large screen, for a small screen, for print, for uh, different things. Whether what's the orientation like? What's the DPI, the display resolution like? So based on how dense your display is, how good your display is, you can serve different kinds of images or styles uh, for that user. Make use of that. These are our friends right now. The other point is web is responsive. Keep it that way. Uh, the very fact that everyone comes and says, "Okay, web responsive web design has come," and and the, and, and the fact that I need to support all the things. There was, there was such a lovely presentation of even the like uh, if I uh, uh, the very first website uh, is the networking now or not working? Seemingly yes. Seemingly yes. 
Oh yes. So let me just go first. Yeah, some people are not able, but they are able to connect to Hathi. If it's visible, correct. <laughs> Okay, so this is CERN's website, uh, not CERN's website, it's the website that CERN is still hosting and it's still keeping for prosperity's sake probably and like, uh, and it says that okay you can browse the first website here yeah, and this is the first website that had come out. You put it on any width and it will work, you know, and so it never said that okay if you reduce the width down to a small thing. Oh, then I will not work. It's fluid, the text wraps automatically and that's the inherent nature of how websites work. Because it's only text. No, text because text. even if you put any, the idea is, it's inherently like this, by putting something that is not text or not scalable like this, you are breaking it. It is inherently like this, it, like if you take a word document, it will not scale like this. It will give you a scroll bar, it, if you take some other documents, it's not so fluid, because it never thought. And therefore, one of the good ways, one of the good ways, so you always have to start at one point and go towards the other point, right? There is only one end of the spectrum when you come to at least screen sizes. That is zero. So the minimum screen size is zero. It cannot be negative screen size and it can go to as wide as I don't know what. Right? It makes sense to start from the minimum width as you possible as you can and then start out from there to increase the width and change your layouts and things according to that. And this approach is generally called mobile first. Alright? And I think this is something that you should also do. Design something for the small screen and then scale it up to a bigger screen because something that you design for the small screen will anyways automatically scale to a bigger screen. But something that you do for a bigger screen will not scale down. That is uh, something that is possible or uh, not possible. So, I would want you to write your CSS in a way that you start, uh, it works in a very small screen and then from there you can proceed from there onwards. Uh, the last slide before we start the CSS thing is that there is no mobile web. Uh, it's, this has come up very recently, oh, we are in the mobile industry now, the mobile, where we are making websites for the mobile now. It's the same website that generally people see, so make sure that it works across mobile to any broad way that's possible. Just keep these points in mind. If we have the network up, just clone my repository or just copy the files of my repository. Take two minutes to assess the code and start adding CSS to it. Now, one thing I really don't want you to go into and I'm going to give you only 10 minutes to style this code. Only 10 minutes to style this code. Why? Because styling is not that important as I just said. We are going to quickly move into JavaScript because that I think is more important. Just go check check out the code, uh, create a new user, add a couple of expenses, right? See how the thing works and make a style sheet for that. When you make right styles, you might have to modify the markup, but the markup should not have any change in semantics. That is something that you have to ensure. I cannot come to you and ensure that. Which basically means this. Add classes, they don't change semantics. Add any containing uh, HTML elements that have no semantic meaning, things like div. If you want to add div as a container, like you did, add that, but only if you need it. And the goal, as I said, uh, is not to make a very pretty website. There's a bootstrap CSS there, you might as well go ahead and just slap that CSS. That also works. So 10 minutes for you to just discover my code. Uh, Get the CSS bit a little bit working. If you want to make something fancy, you can make something fancy because CSS 3 now allows you to do the few of those fancy things very quickly. Here's a quick uh, set of steps that you need to do uh, uh, that to get my code, right? So my assumption is my code is already there in the repository. I'm creating a new repository from scratch. So I go to initialize my dev. I give a new name. So this is something that you would have already done. So it creates me a repository over here. I can clone this repository through this path. Okay, I'm going to use the terminal to clone it. If I've already downloaded from the browser. Oh, you can download the zip file also. There's a download option. You can download the entire source of the zip to your computer. You commit it? Yeah. Do you have a source tree now? Do you have source tree now? 
Do you have source tree right now? No. Okay, I don't know. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll do this uninterrupted so that people who want to follow can follow this. Uh, Okay, so what I'm doing over here is I have a fresh repository of no root to host. I think it's time. Again, what I want. I think it's time to take this up. Okay, so I, I use the local host over here. So I have a new repository called STG on my computer. Now what I have to simply do is uh, go to the code. I can use, thankfully it's on my computer so I can continue demonstrating it. Uh, I can go to slash ng slash so here I am this is my source code repository everyone following this is my source code repository I can go and uh, browse the code from here right and I can clone this repository on my computer using this so here's what I'm going to do uh, no, I can't have this, but I'll go, go with the presentation first. No, even the code, even the code, even the code, Okay, so that was such a network confusion. You know, I, I, I started off with saying that there are things are failing right at the beginning, and more things are failing, but anyways. Okay, so what we do even if we are not able to follow along for everything. For so is the network now, is it, am I doing it, is it a futile exercise? Showing people how to get my code? Mm, I don't know, just try again. So, my code, my code is there in this folder called of Sovic DG. So, for a graphical user interface, here is my code. That is my code for you, okay? So, you take this entire piece of code and dump it in your, this is my own repository, which is empty right now, just paste it here. This is my code, uh, a, a fresh repository that you might have for yourself. From there, uh, if in case you are using a GUI, you can just see the changes, so it will show all these files are new. So I can do an HGST on <coughs> So these are all the new files there because I have copied it from a different repository and put it in this repository. And I can do a add. Uh, and I can do a push. I So all I did was copy files, add these new files, commit it and push it. So now these files that were there in slash Soviet DG repository are also there in your own repository. The GUI way of doing it will be using source tree. After you've pasted it, it will show you the list of changed files, add all the changes, commit it, push it. Then all those things will go through. I'll run you through the code just because uh, things are failing and uh, we don't want things to fail. Uh, at least reach some... Doesn't matter, no, I'm, we're losing on time in any case. Cool. We're losing on time in any case. So what I had over here, I'll just quickly walk through. I had different pages. Right? And I had split it into body. So I had a home page where I said header, footer and body home and the body home was here and the header and the footer are in these two files. So there it's what Gustav is doing is just compi combining three, these three files. So and on my browser then I go to uh, localhost. I see this. Right? So this is my home page put together, the code that you see, if you already have my code put together, that generates this file. So I can sign up as a new user, say, I may say, my name is Sovic, and I want to password, I'll say, uh, thing, and I say sign up. So it takes me to a page 
which in case in this case the url is still the same which basically is in case my state is signed in i'm serving a different content on my home page it's like a signed in home page in case i'm signed out the home page was the first one that you see once i've signed in i get okay hello sovik these are your your expenses list is currently empty you can add a new expense from here so i am using currently the html uh date type input fields so you see a date selector over there note is a simple text field the amount is a number numeric field right i can probably say i need uh, and the i have not done any css over okay? these things are running out of the box on chrome uh test expense and the amount is say 330000 say add Right. So this new thing gets added, and there's in the list it says text expense amount date. Right. That's the beauty of HTML. In case it's a web browser, it is by the default it will fall back to text. Okay. So you'll have to manually enter what date it is. Now this part, what kind of how to make sure that the date entered is in the right format is a stylistic and something that you have to do in as a part of your HTML. probably how do you make sure that that's still the date but go ahead that doesn't matter so i i i'll probably add another expense over here the following principles of progress enhancement if you wanted you could use the javascript to enable it enable support for this and also the don't support it if you want okay i'm coming to that as i said but anyways so we have two two of them and i i have this thing linked so i can go and this is the url slash to this is my second expense that was created serves only the second expense give me an option to delete and edit so the things that i want you to note and uh, just because i'm skipping things forward things that i want you to note over here is that this delete is right now a get request which is a little bit of discussion that we had the reason i put it as get request is i don't want the deletion to happen immediately as soon as a person clicks something i want to fall back where you ask are you sure that you want to delete it if yes then this is a form This is a form submit that will do a post submit request. If I say yes, delete it, then that thing is gone, right? So you all you need to do, you had to do if the network was working was create HTML templates for all these things and make sure these are open. Similarly, if you see sign out over here, it's right now a link. If I go over here, it will confirm me whether I want to sign out or not. <coughs> But sign out is not such a, such a dangerous activity, right? That as a deletion, right? Because you just signed out. So you can choose to give a form submit. As a post request over there as well. That was your choice. You could have if if I click on that, it will directly be a sign out. Stylistic things that come on top of this are the CSS. With CSS, what you can do is make a form button look like a link. Make a link look like a button. These things can be controlled by CSS, and that is what you have to do in the CSS. If you simply slap on a say the Bootstrap CSS or something like that, uh, those CSS files will come in. Things that I wanted to take you to take care of was. uh that over here we have uh so i what i'll do is i quickly modify the exercise right now on the fly uh, uh we some people did placeholder labels right i want you to implement a placeholder label on your computer which is semantically correct and works as a placeholder label as, as well but does not use the attribute placeholder because that is wrong so can we do that thing as a small exercise right now right i am not advocating that you should do placeholder labels but before i go into that this is going to need you to use javascript by the way i i'll just jump start on that this is going to need you to run javascript so i'll just run through my javascript slides once before you get into that that will be the final exercise which we do as a part of progressive enhancement and we'll end it because the network is failing in any case can you try getting on the network now please you can get your code so net it's on my computer is on the network you can see yeah wifi is off you not connected Wi-Fi is off. Yeah, not there. Yeah. My Wi-Fi is not off. No, it's not connected. Local. One point five. Okay, okay. I am connecting to five G. Okay, time out. The regular work. Regular work. 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 And while it works, I'll just quickly run through my uh, thing so so that we can do the closing thing. A little bit of discussion, questions that we have, uh, and let's see. my closing things were about the javascript which is what i wanted to move in about 5 uh, or 6 minutes before this this time about 10 minutes i have to give you some css 
so we are doing behavior now. Behavior is what is enabled by JavaScript. Okay. So any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. This is something that Jeff Atwood had said in the year 2007. Okay. And he said that as a corollary to the other the principle of least powerful device uh, thing. And, and he said that as a joke and in a way to mock things that were happening even at that time, 2007. What people were doing was, oh, I can do JavaScript and I can get this page. I'll just get this page using JavaScript. I can do this. Let me do that in JavaScript. And simple web page loads were increasing. Uh, a lot of JavaScript content getting downloaded. It gets slower. JavaScript is a uh, procedural object oriented now as well uh, language. Uh, it takes more memory resources than on low power devices and everyone had a tough time uh, coping up with these feature phones at that point of time and even today feature phones are just not well supported. So the JavaScript error handling isn't as robust as HTML and CSS and I'm sure you're aware of all this. Are you aware of all this? Because I think the procedures cannot probably have a default logic. Do you agree with me? First of all, you cannot, if, if something does, doesn't, do, uh, if something is not unacceptable, there cannot be a default alternate logic, right? But there can be a default alternate tag. If I give a tag that you don't, the system doesn't understand, it can say, if I don't understand, I'll go by default div. If I give a logic or if I try to access an object that it doesn't know what that object is, it doesn't know what is the default behavior I have to do. It has to throw an error. Right? But you can always just try catch the error, right? Yeah. You, uh, yeah, this is easy. You can always, you might not be writing that code which is throwing the error. No, but like, uh, what is HTML essentially doing? It's just try catching the error, right? Uh, well, I don't, I don't want to go into internally how the HTML engine is running. Right. It, its implementation will be different. HTML is only a standard. HTML is not the implementation. Right. But a browser is essentially saying, oh, I don't understand this, but let's, let's do this. Catch it and then ignore it, right? Agree. You can always try catch it. I don't disagree on that. It's risky. And it has been risky for a long time, but because you're, it is possible you're, uh, uh, there are lots of assumptions here. I'll come to that. And let me just go ahead with this slide and we'll come to examples where we know things fail and we forget to try catch. You, you try, and, and here humans, we do errors. We forget that, oh, something like this also had to be caught. We do a document dot location and oh no, maybe location doesn't exist on the document in the JavaScript object because the JavaScript was too old or the implementation was out of something. So do you always do a test on is there a location uh, attribute in the document and therefore start using document dot location? You generally start with a certain set of assumptions, right? You never try try cast on that, right? When you do the document dot location or something like that. Uh, but all I'm saying is JavaScript can fail and this is a reality. And then there's Murphy's law. Like today, so many things have been feeling right from the morning. I come here, my Adobe fonts are gone. Uh, I fall back to these fonts. The network is not working. Things are failing even right now. Try catch might also fail. Who knows? Right? It might just go. Maybe the you you're not doing a try catch on things. Maybe there are external JavaScripts that are there which do not are not following the same principles that you are following in your code. But I, what I want to simply say is dependence on JavaScript is a mistake. The fact that there is a JavaScript is also a mistake and also depending on application on JavaScript is a mistake, which is uh, things like as, as we went in that list of the initial priorities that we did, we said that we have to make it all the things that we said, it did not need JavaScript. JavaScript is an enhancement. Yes. If there is JavaScript, then we will give JavaScript and we will enhance the experience. But there are plenty and plenty of websites. Even today, new websites coming up, Reliance 100% on Ajax. I come to the page, it will start loading, load this resource, load that resource, and then the page will come up. That is relying on JavaScript. That is a bad idea. So that's, so that's, that's a very bold statement, but very context based, right? Yes. You could be having an application that absolutely has to rely on JavaScript. Suppose you're loading a list of 10,000 elements and you want to page it. How are you going to do it otherwise? But here's the with, thing. With you, plain HTML, CSS, how are you going to do it? I have to show 10,000 elements. Look, now design can happen at different levels. If you know the limitations of the system, you will design it in the, the system in a way in which there is a progressive enhancement. You start off with listing 
100 and give a pagination on that. If there is JavaScript, kick the JavaScript in, load the next test, next 900. Would have a fallback. Not a fallback. Progressive enhancement, not graceful degradation. Yeah. Is the other way around. I would rather say the fallback is JavaScript is there. Cool. Yeah. Let me also load the other 900. Okay. So let me ask you this question. Yes. So in, in the day and age where writing extra code just makes a nightmare later, right? Hmm? If hmm? you can reduce the amount of code that a developer has to write to do anything, hmm? and that requires JavaScript, considering that 90% of the browsers in an enterprise app world, hmm? right? Will have JavaScript enabled. Why shouldn't you do it? So, is your, can I translate this question to uh, your assumption being JavaScript is always enabled and therefore no, it's okay? It's context based. You can't just say you shouldn't use JavaScript. No, I, did, I, did I ever, okay. Did I ever say do not use JavaScript? I did not say that. If you got that message, don't take that message. This message says dependence on JavaScript is a mistake, not using JavaScript is a mistake. Your app should work without JavaScript also. Yeah. And let's take mm -hmm. the rest of the discussion after the session gets over. Right. I wanted to make a point for this specific app as an example. Suppose you are doing for behavioral things, you are hiding a div and you give a button to open that div. Say there's a form, right? There's a button, uh, there's a link to add, uh, to open that form and to close that form. Be prepared for the fact that if JavaScript fails, and if someone hits that link, it actually takes to a page that serves that form. So you design your system like that. So right now, if I have a page for sign up form, sign in form, and on my home page, I have a sign up form and a sign in form, I might collapse them. The You can always inject uh, or trigger a on click on, uh, hand, have a on click handler on A, and you can hijack the behavior. But in case the JavaScript trigger is not happening, or even the fact that when you do a prevent default or you uh, on on a uh, on a particular event, do it right at the end. Don't do it right at the beginning because right at the beginning you prevent the default behavior that is running through the link, and then somewhere something happens in the code, whatever it might happen. Say it happens in the code, and what this user is clicking on that and nothing is happening, that's a bad idea. Some websites do this because some websites have. Like a login in the corner, uh -huh. where you click on it and a drop down comes up. But when the website is still loading and somebody clicks that, nothing happens. Nothing happens. But some websites code it to go to a login page. Absolutely. Which is like a good point. Very, very, very good point. That That is, in fact, very important. In fact, I think it's even a bigger message that I want to give that JavaScript dependence is a mistake. Even things like when you're doing any Ajax calls, don't do a page change or a main page content change unless and until you are very sure that you will be able to, in my opinion, update the URL, which means it should support the HTML5 history APIs, right? So you should know that it supports history APIs and therefore I'll use Ajax on this. Because the older systems, in any case, it will work as a simple click through, right? So don't do, don't make such mistakes. I have a question here. Uh, so yes. I'm building an Angular app or some, some MVC or using an SP or something, like an SP or something. So, using these things, like I, I have to make Ajax calls to call in my views. Without doing that, like, I mean, if, if I want to go progressively, then I would have to build that on a, on a, on a conventional system, with PHP and all that, and then take in JavaScript and remove all that content uh, via in my thing. Right? I'll be, I'll be very honest, I did not follow all, all the parts that you said. Uh, what what is the place in which you will not be able to? Uh, what is the part that you will not be able to do? No, the point my, is that my entire Angular uses mm -hmm. a certain framework, a certain system. So okay. If you, want, if you want to follow this method, you would not be able to use Angular. You would need to have PHP as a backend. Like he's talking about using with an API and have a. Oh, just an API and a JavaScript. Yes. I, and I'm saying that in my in my view, that is not the uh, JavaScript is always an optional component of the app. We yeah, talked about so many devices that do not take. Views are coming in through Ajax. If all? All of my views, everything that you see. So see it's coming in through Ajax. Uh, so there are two. In principle, that is wrong. Yeah, An implementation of that, in principle, is wrong. But of course, you're. And the other part is this is also a Schrodinger cat kind of situation. You don't know what the other views might come in until unless you implement the other options. When Because then the other options are not there, the only way the calls can come in are through the JavaScript calls to the APIs. Right? So things like, as he said, initially loading and some things happening at that point of time, 
can easily happen and the thing is are we sort of like clinging on to like like if we keep supporting crappy devices that don't support javascript that that's when they'll stick around but if you just say okay no like you know i'm going to start coding in angular i'm going to start coding in node and i'm going to be serving pages which have ajax requests then everyone will just move to devices which are better right so it's it's sort of like you know holding on to something old so that we don't you know use the latest so, technology so did you did you also give me a fist of five when i asked that you agree with the mission of world wide w3c that so that is the idea actually so i think uh, it's not about even devices uh, so many when so we mentioned that uh, you are assuming that js is enabled right it also means that you are assuming that the guy is on a good bandwidth so now if you in this scenario a uh, lot of sites will actually not work when you have like a you know an issue with the wifi or whatever or you are on the phone and you are on an edge connection i think the whole idea here is that you know uh, whether a person is on a i mean even on a low bandwidth he should be able to actually go through i mean i am giving examples in clear to course right uh, when we redesigned like we were depending on uh, our home page to have javascript right uh, so even for an auto suggest and stuff like that right and there were people who actually couldn't proceed the uh, you know, search so we actually made the home page uh, javascript free even though like it's a single page app the entire from search form to uh, the search results is a single page app it actually works so if you, if you don't have javascript loaded it will actually render the srp and it will give the, the single page app a second chance to load the javascript Right, so I think that's an important uh, sort of point also to be noted here. The devices, even though they get capable, they may not have network bandwidth. So, so, so can you ask this question, right? Going with the clear trip example, yeah. you said on the home page you made it JavaScript free, but once I search for a flight and I have to look at the options, you can't make that page JavaScript free, right? I, yeah, I mean, we've taken a call, but I think I I I tell I tell you, I think you can make it JavaScript free. I don't see any reason for it to not be How JavaScript free. Uh, we'll talk about that then. Uh, later, because we we'll no, but like no, the reason I want to ask. Okay, so what is you're claiming that dependence on JavaScript is a mistake, right? Yes. Clear is obviously not a very niche website. It's a public website accessed by thousands and millions of people. Okay. How are you going to make it JavaScript free? Are you saying you can't show data without JavaScript? Is it going to have the same user experience? That is different. No, that is different. different. That is it's different. not different. different. Are you saying that's that you can't just, show a resource on the web without JavaScript? That is what you seem to be saying. That you you are, you are, you are not making it reachable. You are not but making it locatable. Don't have JavaScript. I think exactly. You have to understand. Wait, so, so hold on, hold on. Can you can you make a statement of dependence on JavaScript is a mistake? I think it's overkill. No. Try and not right. use JavaScript. Maybe a better way of saying it. No, I am. I am saying. I am saying. I'm saying I'm inverting. I, all I am saying is I am inverting. We build something without JavaScript, then add it. That's what I claim. I, I claim build something just so that you don't have this error. Even even in your example, you don't want the error dialog coming up. You don't want the client to be at any point of time stuck. And also the fact that it's not always about enabling. It's it's there are two factors to it. One factor is JavaScript not being there. That is hardly a question anymore. If you just narrow down your vision to just five browsers, six devices, or six mobile browsers, that's it. The world today, at this very point of time, has more browsers than we can think of. First, the second, the second point is you can always claim that okay, I'm not, I don't care to serve those people. I don't care to serve places which have low bandwidth. The third thing is it's also about a good practice so that if there is a failure of technology, then it can still continue serving the content. There were cases, and many of them famous in past, where their JavaScript has failed even on the Google Chrome download page, ja and they were using a JavaScript hack in their own page, and the download was stopped for two hours. That's a mistake, a person, and you did not need JavaScript at that point of time. Which is again not to say, and I'm, I'm, I'm insisting on this. I'm not saying don't use JavaScript. I'm saying that you build your system for without JavaScript, then bring in JavaScript. Or JavaScript is always an optional component on the web. Plus the fact that you want to serve as much set of devices, as much set of user agents for everyone going into the future. Because five years down, back in time, we never realized that we are going to run into such bandwidth issues as we have run into right now. Because five years back, there was a phase of time when we always assumed bandwidth is going to increase. 
Then Sunday mobiles came in and the mobile networks never had that bandwidth. Everyone thought everyone will have a line connection. Bandwidth went down. Everything went down. So the fact that you are relying on a something that is, and we also established that this is an unknown. We also said the only thing known right now is there's a client and the, there's a server. There's an HTTP connection. There's a I, I should be able to serve a resource. That's it. But use JavaScript. And I'm not saying don't use JavaScript. So just be prepared for failures is my message. So dependence basically means if the person doesn't have JavaScript or if the person doesn't have uh, 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 the JavaScript has not kicked in yet, it has not loaded, any of those things have happened. The fact that you are able to still wake up from a failure situation right now like the way things that we are having right now because somewhere someone could have said that Wi-Fi is reliable. It will never fail, it will never break and a room of 20, 30 people will never have a problem. Well, we are not having that in 2014. Right? So, the other thing that I want you to share is just in case you are modifying the DOM and styles, don't put in inline styles. It it hampers the principles of modularity as well. Styles should be separate. Put in classes. Okay? Don't, don't uh, do this. Make your JavaScript unobtrusive as well. So, the, if you go through the HTML5 boilerplate code, that's a very good starting point because they have all the leading edge practices incorporated in their code. They put all their, all their script files right at the end or you may use async attribute to make it uh, load in parallel. Uh, <laughs> don't rely on it on the head because the entire DOM loading or the page loading has to wait until your entire JavaScript loads. And these days JavaScript files are getting really big. Really, really big. Uh, another point is uh, don't do browser sniffing. JavaScript uh, and also backend programmers, it is, uh, I don't think there are many backend programmers here. Don't use JavaScript uh, browser sniffing. Uh, detect features, huh? because when you do browser sniffing, what you're relying on is just because a person has X browser, he'll have X set of features and I'll be able to use them. Right? But if you detect features, things like, okay, does it have SVG support? Does it have HTML5, the history appears? And then I'll go ahead and use them. Does it have those things? And to that end, what helps you is something known as modernizer. Has anyone not heard of the modernizer stuff? There are people who have not heard of modernizer. It is there, I don't know if the network is up yet. It is there on my computer uh, as well. Uh, you could have got it. Probably go back and read on it what modernizer does. It's a set of tests written right at the beginning. Put Include only that file in the head, which makes you available two things. One is CSS classes. And the second is a... a, a a JavaScript object in which you have all the booleans. So if you, you have a modernizer.svg, it will return true if there is SVG support, false if there is no SVG support. And for as an example, even today, there are so many Android 2.3, uh, 2.2 uh, phones around, they don't have these things support uh, at this point of time. So use modernizer. The way to use classes is when modernizer script runs to the brute tag, that is the HTML tag, it adds a set of classes, which basically means in the CSS file, you can simply say dot svg space dot any of your element then include a background image that is does it make sense because the root element has dot svg and then dot thing and you can include those things look at look up uh, modernizer it will be a really useful tool for you to detect features and therefore apply it it's also very much part of making sure from a weaker system to a most modern system you are able to use it all throughout across the thing uh, uh, so I gave the slide uh, exhibit restraint and plan well, but do use it and I wanted you to do it. Uh, we have less time. Uh, if anyone can do a quick implementation of placeholder labels, that will be good. We can do a JavaScript uh, placeholder label thing. Otherwise, I have a couple of more slides and then I'll end. Yeah. I haven't discussed uh, web fonts. I, I wanted to discuss web fonts. And as a part of the JavaScript things, I wanted to discuss a little bit of web fonts. Uh, one. From my point part, the web font uh, usage, the flaw that I see most of the web websites have uh, is the fact that you rely on the web font loading until and until un, uh, until the point of time the page is rendered on screen, and that is the flaw that I feel. So, what exactly do you want to discuss in web fonts? Can can yeah, you just so highlight? If you want to do that, where we need to end up using end up using JavaScript. So there's uh, there's this thing called. Uh, Answer is yes, if you want to do that well, you end up using JavaScript, that is correct. Which also means that if there is no JavaScript, you are running on fallback fonts, 
which are which is okay okay because not all websites have to look in the same in the every browser enabling functionality is more important fonts are aesthetics do you agree with me right so if there is javascript go ahead use web fonts there is something known as web font loader there is that's a open source library it also has these events and you what you can do is it while it's loading web fonts you can detect whether a font is loaded or it has not loaded and therefore once the font is loaded you can just replace the page content with that and with css3 you can also add some effect or something like that if you want to do that but there are plenty and plenty of websites which just show me a blank screen initially on my phone for at least about 15 seconds before the, the font loads and Mark, thank huh? Mark, that is also because of how the browser deals with uh, fonts for example webkit and chrome they basically don't load the font firefox so does it yeah and firefox waits for a second or two and then loads the I am coming. I am coming to that point. I just complete the presentation. We'll try to do a placeholder label imp uh, implementation right at the end of the thing for whoever is interested because we want to end on time as well. Uh, my parting thoughts uh, before this, and this is what I wanted to say in a lot of your questions. The answers are design has to be okay as long as you are following standards. And this part where where uh, the behavior of one browser is different than the other, this is actually true in not only. these implementation also javascript implementations also html implementations because at the end of the day all these are standards all rendering engines are advised to follow or, or they should be following this but they can always take a detour on this be it css be it html they have been doing it in the past there have been bugs and that's why jquery exists even for Java, javascript and there was a recent long list of bugs and uh, i i remember apple also retweeted it uh by paul irish there was a long list there was a recent uh, uh page published that you might not need jquery and it had a parallel code samples using pure javascript without jquery a follow up by paul irish and uh, the other guy they said you might not be jquery if you follow if you are careful about these bugs and they went on to list i don't know there was a huge list of bugs on even modern day web browsers So this is another point where be careful because things might fail. It's just about being able to recover from a failure. Nothing else. Nothing is stopping you from using Ajax or something else, and things like that. And, or, or any fancy JavaScript effects. Go ahead, provided you take care of the failure standards. Uh, the next, I think this is different. So be very clear about this. Uh, when I when I took the name of the browser that should not be named. That's usually a hatred for browser bugs, not the fact that it's a old browser. And also keep this in mind that it doesn't have to look the same in that browser. It just has to enable functionality, just in case people are accessing the web using such browsers. And uh, countries are there which are still uh, using that browser, and or different browsers which are probably worse. This is a different case. Uh, so supporting the latter uh, does not mean that it has to look the same as the new one. So. Please give give away that notion of whatever is the experience uh, that uh, Sir pointed out that we need uh, best experience. It is okay in the older browser you just give the basic experience, but make sure the thing is available. That's it. Give the best experience in the latest ones. And this point about polyfill, something that Arpan just pointed out that you can make some people do or make browsers do things that it natively doesn't support. Uh, I think that are, those are unnecessary. Uh, Uh, you can do away with polyfills uh and when i say unnecessary i'm not saying don't use it i'm saying that it might not be required uh so you might have do a, a slight design work around because all these polyfills and all these hacks that you do you're targeting specific either browsers or user agents they are not based on uh, feature detection and uh, this one is based on feature detection though for some polyfills are and there's a long list of polyfills Uh, on uh, a site called HTML5, please. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about that site. Also, uh, was there on my page in the list of links for your reference. Uh, if you want to use those polyfills, you can. But say, say as an example, uh, if you do a standards-driven code, uh, let me take this placeholder example itself. If an input doesn't have the placeholder, just because it's following the older <laughs> HTML standards, it is okay because labels it still should have. right it is okay if the placeholder is not visible because you should not rely on a placeholder in the first place placeholder is only supposed to be a hint on top of what a label is right and uh, using front end frameworks doesn't really prevent progressive enhancement 
Angular JS is something that uh, he's pointed to. I've not used it. Uh, we can probably do a discussion on that whether it's a good idea to do it or not idea to do it. But this is a big thing. I think this every every one every web developer web user should just remember this part that we should not assume there is too much unknown in this thing, and it's only going to get worse from today onwards. If today we give a bold statement saying that of course there are only these five web browsers today, of course there are only these many things, it's not going to be the same tomorrow. Five years from now, and there's a very good statement that, that says that only if you're backwards compatible will you be forwards compatible. For you to be forwards compatible, you have to ensure backwards compatibility. That's one of the best ways to deal that. So just because older systems are, be, are able to use it, you can almost assume that your system will be able to use it. Although your particular <laughs> implementation might might not work the way you are intending it to work. In a way. Uh, Coming back to my original question, why do we not care about some web browser? Do you have a different answer this time, anyone? <laughs> okay, I break this. I think we are not as flexible as the medium demands us to be. Clearly. We, uh, web is a very different medium from everything else, at least today. It is something that is giving us, uh, it's not like print, it's not like a TV, it's not like a cell phone. It is such a mixture of all these things. And if you can read this article, and I strongly urge you to read this article. This is an article that was published almost 14 years back. And right at the beginning when this was done. If you can read it, you will probably understand what I mean by saying that you are not flexible enough. I can take some questions. We can go ahead with the code. I can uh, probably share you my buggy Python code so that you might want to interface your things with uh, uh, that code in the future. Uh, we can probably implement a placeholder uh, label implementation in a progressive enhancement way. That's a very small thing that I'm taking uh, because of all this confusion that happened. How do I do the placeholder implementation? I, I have a small implementation. I had it. Let me see if I can quickly fetch it. So. That's a date field, right? Sorry? That was a date field, right? That was a date field, yes. Input type equal to date. So let me see, I, I think I have this. <coughs> Okay, so this is one thing that I did. So there are a few things that I did over here. These, if you remember, these were date fields, right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, again, this is a design hack that I had to do uh, in a way. I had to replace the date field with check uh, text fields. Why? Because the date field has a default way of taking input, and you cannot override it. At least till today in Chrome, uh, there are uh, proposals that will let you override what the default text comes like, whether you do not want the drop down of the calendar that comes and things like that. So I had to convert that into a text field. And these things right now look as uh, placeholders, uh, but they are actually not. And uh, they are our, they are the same labels and I can probably 
And the thing is, in the date, I can always ensure that you know you the field is big enough that the date fits by this time, this space, or the fact that uh, there's a pad enough padding that uh, this thing goes keeps on the side, or the fact that this thing is small enough to be on the top, and the text runs in the bottom. Uh, I will quickly uh, show the inspector. It is. This is Chrome browser. This is standard Chrome browser. Okay, so if you look at this, we have a label, we have an input, there is hardly any change from the code that you had seen over there except for there is a date field class. There are a couple of classes over here. And uh, no placeholders, what I am simply doing is, I am positioning at absolute on top of the input, I am registering a click over there, as soon as you tap, uh, I, I, in fact I don't need to register a click, click because if you click on the label, it automatically focuses on the field. Right? That's a native thing of the browser itself. So as soon as this is the label or in the field itself, so if you see uh, this becomes a uh, pointer arrow to this becomes this. So the label actually ends here. So I can, of course, that this is also, this behavior can also be overridden by CSS. So when I click on this, what I've done is I'll move the label text on the side because it's very important for the person to know what the field stands for after he's written something. Again, one of the very basic design flows that people make when they use placeholders. Well, if you put a content and you don't know what the field is for, that's a problem. So one of the ways is, this is one of the solutions that you can go for. But you don't really even need to move the node to the bottom, right? You can leave it where it is and have the... Absolutely, that's a design choice. That's a design choice. It's a, you can do it. The reason I moved to the corner is because I had to make the field bigger. Height bigger, that's it. And things like that. So, and this will work across even older browsers, I think. Should work. It's just... I, I, I actually, I, this code was not incomplete, so I just told it. Okay, I don't know what user I'm using. Uh, so, but the idea is not that you have to have disabled JavaScript, okay? So I have an add field here. So if the JavaScript is disabled, this is how it works. So I have the fields here. I have an add here. This is it becomes a list view. If I click on add, I jump to this field, the the form that is below this thing, right? So the functionality is still enabled even if there is no JavaScript over here. The only thing that I need to take care of over here is the moment I hide this at the point of when I in, in, include JavaScript. This is a hash fragment URL right now, which is jumping into that div ID uh, of the form because you click on that uh, this link and you jump below. The moment I hide that form and I collapse it, I should what I do is uh, change the the link destination of the link to a page that is uh, giving me the add expense form, which is slash add in my URL. In that case, even if JavaScript fails later, right, the form is hidden. If someone clicks through it, it'll at least go to that page where you can add a field. So these are little things that you can do to improve on the implementation. So URL can be added through JavaScript, right? Right now it is not. Right now it is not. It is not a complete solution. But I am telling you this is how it should be done. How do you the so what I did was I have an input field and I have a label. It's, there's a container box paragraph for me around that. I make a position absolute of the label on top of the input field. Do you actually do location or and then append hash back to it? Over here, this is the native behavior of the browser, I don't do this. Over here, it is the native uh, thing. So when you add this a single page after it goes down, but you also update the URL. That is something, as I said, again, a native behavior of the browser. I did not add it, the browser added it. I did not do have to do anything to add that hash. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around. Uh, and feedback is appreciated. Okay, I just I just need to make an announcement. Uh, I think yesterday 
you must have uh, come to know that we're going to basically have a slot on Saturday, 5 p.m. So, uh, you guys can actually present your design solutions that we worked on yesterday, right? So I think it's like I I also tweeted this. It's important that everyone works on this and at least kind of uh, uh, kind of like you know comes up with some concept so that you know you kind of go through the entire process. So yeah, I really encourage you guys to actually work on it and maybe even present it. And if you guys want to run it by me or you know discuss some ideas and around till Saturday. So. I think some people have actually put it up, so I'll be reviewing that today. Uh, in response, can you also present what you think are good ideas? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll put out some thoughts, but I just don't want to kind of uh, influence your... Do it at the end. Ah, okay, sure. End. Yeah, sure. Okay. Definitely. Alright, thank you guys. Uh,